All right. So why are there different interpretations? Why are there different interpretations? Come on, just let's just have a popcorn here. Just shout from where you're seated. Why do you think there are different interpretations? Come on, no wrong answers. Just shout out an answer. Yes. Different traditions. That's right. What else? Different cultures. Yes. Different translations that we're reading. That's right. Different personalities. All right. Praise God. Let me just share with you six basic reasons why there are different interpretations. So we will make this as our, our introduction as to the importance of hermeneutics. Number one, the word that's underlined and different uh, color is the one that's blank in your notes. So please write down the word differently. We all understand differently from others. And basically, that's the question. Why do we understand differently from others? Well, friends, basically, we have three biases or three backgrounds you have a personal background you know you have an educational background your upbringing is different we all have a cultural background i was born in manila but i grew up in cebu and so uh tagalog and cebuano and then of course the biggest circle of all is our theological background you know yung kinalakihan natin and so all of this can contribute to the differences in the way we understand the Bible. We'll look into this in, in detail later on. But number two, write down the word, jump. That's the, words, the word that's blank in your notes. We have a tendency to jump quickly to conclusions. You know, when we read the Bible, we make a lot of assumptions. You know, we read a word and we assume immediately that that word, the way it's understood, is the way we understand it today. But brothers and sisters, let me just give you an example. Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. All together now, ready, read. Now, if you are to understand this passage, this verse, what would be the key word here that you need to understand? The word salt. And of course, we jump quickly to conclusion. Our understanding of salt is sodium chloride today, the one that we use in our, in our food, in our preparation for food. So that's jumping quickly to conclusion. Let me say to you right now, this salt that Jesus Christ is talking about has nothing to do with sodium chloride or the salt that we use in the kitchen. Later on, we'll look into that. But that's what it means, jumping quickly to conclusion. And then, number three, we tend to be not open to new things that are being said. We tend to be not open... You know, meron tayong kasabihan sa Cebuan at sa Tagalog. Uh, sarado kandado. You know? Kung ano yung kinalakihan mo, sa Cebuano, we say, Kung sa'y kikamataan, mo'y kamatian. Kung ano kinalakihan, siyang kamamatayan. And so, we, uh, we're, we're close-minded. We don't want to uh, open up to new things that are being said. Number four, we have a tendency to understand the part and not the whole. Two blanks in your notes. We have a tendency to understand the part and not the whole. And this is where we take a verse out of its context. We just focus on that particular verse. Now, friends, we need to realize that it's the whole that gives the part the meaning. That means you need to understand the whole first before you can understand the part. Now, the way to explain this, let me, let me draw something here. Now, if you've attended the Paul's project already before, please don't answer the question because you already know the answer, all right? So here's my drawing. Let's say I'm drawing this. And then we're going to identify a part, all right? So that's my drawing right there. And then let's identify a part. What is that part? Ears, all right? You look that as, as ears because you look at the hole as a what? You assume that the hole is a rabbit. Now, friends... I'm the one who drew this, and I can tell you right now, I did not draw a rabbit. If I did not draw a rabbit, that means those are not ears. Because what I drew, actually, is a duck looking up. So if that's a duck looking up, what is the part? The part becomes the beak. So friends, here's a very important principle. When we're reading our Bibles, remember this, 
when we're reading our Bibles, it's not important what you see. Alright? Because you may be looking at a rabbit. What is important is what was the intention of the author. What was it that he actually drew? Not what you see, but what the author actually drew or what he intended to write. So that's principle number four, and that's very important. And a classic example of this is, you know, during a worship meeting, a worship service, during a prayer meeting, the pastor would say, Oh, prayer meeting na tayo. We said 7 o'clock, alas 8 na, wala pang tao. It's just the three of us. But we're going to start. Anyway, the Bible says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. All right, we always use that verse. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, kindly open up to Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Come on. If you have your Bibles with you, and if you forgot to bring your Bible, please bring them tomorrow. We need your Bibles tomorrow. Matthew 18, 20. Now, you will notice in your Bible, depending on the size of the Bible, but the average size Bible would have a paragraph division. Diba? Now, in the paragraph division where you find Matthew 18, 20, what verse where you find the paragraph starts? Saan verse nagsimula yung paragraph? Matthew 18, 20 is inside the paragraph. At what verse do you see the paragraph starts? Verse 15. All right, verse 15. In fact, may title sa ibabaw. Anong title sa ibabaw? Ang title na kasulat, A Brother Who Sins Against You. So that's the context, all right? We already have the paragraph division. There's a title. So the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. He sabi niya, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. That means, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to reconcile, whose initiative should it be? The offender or the offended? Sino dapat mag-initiate na makipag-reconcile? Yung naka-offend o yung na-offend? Sabi ni Jesus, yung na-offend dapat mag-take ng initiative. If your brother sins against you, ikaw na na-offend, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Now, obviously, according to our Filipino culture, that's not the way things happen, isn't it? Kasi sa ating kung sino nagkasala siya, ang? Well, the problem with that is, yung nagkasala, we're not even aware na nagkasala tayo. So, how can we approach and reconcile? We're not even aware that we, you know, offended you. So, yung na-offend should be the one to take the initiative to approach the offended, uh, the offending party. And then it says, just between the two of you. Again, in the Filipino culture, that's not what's happening. You know, if Pastor George did something na offend ka, then you would approach somebody, alam mo si Pastor George, grabing ginawa niya. <laughs> Sobrang ginawa ni Pastor. Tapos ikaw naman na sinabihan, you will talk to another man, uy, si Pastor George pala, grabe palang ginawa niya. You know, the whole church knows about it already, except si Pastor George. And so again, that's the uh, problem we have in our culture. But here it says, just between the two of you, but then if he will listen, then good. If he will not listen, sabi, take one or two others along. Alright? So if you take one, ilan kayo? There's three of you. So that's what verse 20 says, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. The context is not a prayer meeting, it's not the worship service, it's a reconciliation meeting. Alright? The context of Matthew 18, 20 is a reconciliation meeting. And so when you reconcile with somebody, that's Matthew 18, 20. You know the problem if we make this as the prayer meeting? Look at this. Grammatically, how many ang kailangan? What's the prerequisite before God will be there? Ilan ang kailangan? Dapat merong? Two or three. How about during the prayer meeting, there was only one. The pastor was alone. Will God be there? No, God will not be there kasi kailangan two or three. I mean, if you cons be consistent with it grammatically. But friends, obviously, God is there. Yung two or three dyan, the offended and the offender, and then, of course, the one witness na dinala. Alright, so that's, a, that, that's an example. And then, number five, we tend to read our ideas back into the Bible. Our tendency is to use our, you know, our stock knowledge, our vocabulary, our understanding of how things work, and then use that to, as a way to understand the Bible. 
Now, ito pong mga ideas, it's called pre-understanding, biases, or presuppositions. There are four levels of biases. Ang first level is uh, what we call the informational level. Write down the word informational. That's the blank in your notes. The first level of biases, mga presupposition natin, is called informational level. Again, this is our understanding of uh, yung vocabulary natin, our understanding of things. So again, for example, like uh, we've read already Matthew 5.13. What's the key word here? Salt. So, so yung ating salt, understanding is yung salt sa, sa kusina, sodium chloride. And so we, we use that as a way to understand this verse. But you know what, friends? Very interesting, the way the Lord Jesus Christ talked about this salt. Sabi niya, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Now, those of you who are trained, trained chemically, you know that sodium chloride is one of the more, most stable chemical compound. It doesn't lose its savor. It doesn't lose its nature. So what is this that if salt loses its saltiness? Now, what is good is that the Lord Jesus Christ used the same metaphor in another passage, but then in this other passage, He included the function of the salt. So Luke chapter 14, 34 to 35, he said, Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, exactly the same words, how can it be made salty again? And then, the function of the salt. It is fit neither for the what? The soil, nor for the manure pile. Now, this is not sodium chloride. It's used for the soil and the manure pile. And of course, in Jerusalem, they have two major sources of salt. They have the Mediterranean Sea, now, this is salt water. They would evaporate the Mediterranean Sea water and then you'll be left with a, you know, re relatively pure salt. That's what you use in the kitchen for food preparation. But the other major source of salt is the Dead Sea. Now, the Dead Sea salt is not sodium chloride. And uh, we know that the Dead Sea is the saltiest body of water in the entire world. Do you know how salty the Dead Sea is? If you compare the water from the Pacific Ocean, if you evaporate this water, you'll be left with about 79 pounds of salt. Okay, evaporate one ton of water from the Pacific Ocean, you'll be left with 79 pounds. And then, if you evaporate one ton of water from the Atlantic Ocean, you'll be left with about 81 pounds of salt. So which is saltier, the Pacific or the Atlantic? The Atlantic is a little saltier than the Pacific Ocean. But friends, if you evaporate the same amount of water, one ton of water, you'll be left with about 500 pounds of salt from the Dead Sea. That's how salty it is. It is so salty, there is no marine life in the Dead Sea. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. I mean, you don't go fishing in the Dead Sea. You'll die waiting for the fish to come. And you'll be part of the Dead Sea. All right? And so, you won't get a fish there. In fact, it is so compact, you know, the buoyancy is so high, you can actually float, you don't move, you, you'll just float. It's the best place to read the newspaper, you know? <laughs> While you're uh, sunbathing or floating in the Dead Sea. You know, I was in Israel last year, and I did this. I was reading our map, you know, the direction we were going. I was reading our map while floating in the Dead Sea, there. So that was reading the map. So you can actually do this. But then, here's one thing very significant about the Dead Sea. The source of water from the Dead Sea, there are four or five tributaries, but the main source is this body of water, this river. What is that river? That's the Jordan River. And the source of the Jordan River is this body of water up, up there. What is this lake? It's the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee, is that fresh water or salt water? That's fresh water. Can you imagine? The major source for the water in the Dead Sea is fresh water and yet it's the saltiest body of water in the entire world that's interesting isn't it not only that but the elevation you see here's the dead sea uh, here's the mediterranean sea right here and then here's the dead sea from the top it looks like they're just on the same level but actually if you look at it from the side view here's the level of the mediterranean sea and then you find here the level of the dead sea and it's still decreasing right now and you need to go down almost half a kilometer. You need to go down half a kilometer in order to reach the, the water level of the Dead Sea. 
That means, friends, the implication is the water from the Jordan River as it flows into the Dead Sea, the water is dumped into the Dead Sea, no exit, no outlet, it's all dumped in the Dead Sea because it's lower. Now, what is so interesting is the water level is not going up. In fact, it's going down. It's surrounded by desert and the water just keeps on evaporating. And so you have there the salt deposits. And uh, again, when I was there, I saw the 10 uh, minerals that can be found in the Dead Sea. The number one most, you know, most, uh, uh, the mineral that you find most in the Dead Sea is potassium. That's there. And uh, my wife, you know, he's a horticulturist from Eupilus Banyos. Sa she said that the complete fertilizer is the NPK, the nitrogen, the uh, phosphorus, and then the potassium. You need the potassium in order to grow the flowers and the fruits. And so they, they get the salt from the Dead Sea and then mix it with the soil as a fertilizer. So that's the first function of the Dead Sea salt. And so this potash that is contained in the Dead Sea, according to one encyclopedia, there's enough potash in the Dead Sea to supply the needs of the entire world for the next 2,000 years. It's so rich with potash. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ said, salt is good, but if it loses saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil. The first function Jesus Christ had in mind is salt as a fertilizing agent to make good things grow. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ said, you are the salt of the earth, that means the function he had in mind is act as a fertilizer. If you're the only born-again Christian in your office, or in your family, then act as a fertilizer, make good things grow. That people will be infected by your honesty. People will be infected by the way you talk. People will be inf infected by your, you know, by the way you arrive on time. Although not so much for Filipinos, but uh, again, that's a fertilizing agent. But then secondly, as a manure pile. And here, the function of salt is a disinfecting agent. During that time, of course, they didn't have flush toilets. In many countries of, uh, of the world today, they still don't have flush toilets. So what they would do, they would go down the bottom of the yard. You know, if they have to download something. <laughs> and so after they download, there would be a box full of salt from the Dead Sea. They'll grab a handful and then sprinkle it on what they downloaded. <laughs> And then that will act as a disinfecting agent to stop bad things from spreading. And so Jesus Christ said, you are the salt of the earth. Act as a disinfecting agent. Stop bad things from spreading. You know, sometimes Christians, they would pass around text messages, mga joke, and it's a dirty joke. And you know, we don't have any business passing around these dirty jokes. We are a, we are a disinfecting agent. We are to stop bad things from spreading. So this, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ had in mind when he said, you are the salt of the earth. So again, that's the informational level. We, we should not assume that our stock knowledge is the same as the way words are defined in the Bible. Number two is the attitudinal level. You know, our disposition, how we feel emotionally when we read the Bible, you know, they can all influence the way we understand the Bible. For example, which book do you usually go when you're discouraged? You know, when you're discouraged, which book do you usually read? You open to the book of Psalms. I know some people read already the book of Revelation, you know. <laughs> Lord, sana magunaw ng mundo, Panginoon. Sana dumating na kayo. I know some people would read the book of Revelation. But you know, our emotional state can determine the way we understand the Bible. When I was still courting my wife, you know, I love to read the Song of Songs. You know the Song of Solomon? Wow, very erotic book. I love to read that. Now, after 26 years of marriage, I love to read the book of Lamentations. And so, no, no, no. Brad, we'll edit this, okay? We'll cut this. Baka makarating sa wife ko yan. But uh, what we're saying here is a lot of times, our emotional state can influence the way we understand the Bible. Now, this is a true story. There was a sister in the Lord she wanted to get married. You know, she's way past the calendar age. Ano yung calendar age? 31. She's way past 31 years old. And no boyfriend. And so she prayed to God, Lord, give me a boyfriend. Lord, there's this somebody may crush ya. There's this somebody in our fellowship. Lord, just 
make him get interested in me. She prayed for one year and the guy didn't even talk to her. And then she prayed another year. Lord, open his eyes. Kumanligo to Lord, sasagutin ko agad to. Again, the second year, the guy didn't even talk to her. And then the third year, she's in crisis now. For three years, she prayed for this guy. Lord, anong gagawin ko? Anong gagawin ko? Pero nga ng Biblia pa, uh, Brad. And so what she did, like many other Christians would do, three years she'd been praying and sabi niya, Lord, please talk to me. She closed her eyes. And then she pointed, Lord, speak to me. Aba. When she opened her Bible, true story, it landed on Luke 13, 6 to 9. He told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years now, <laughs> I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? <laughs> Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. <laughs> and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Now tell me, what's the interpretation? <laughs> One more year. One more year. <laughs> you know, you know our, our emotional state, our situation can dictate the way we understand the Bible. And so again, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ did not mean that parable to address such issue, but that's the way we handle it. But then... Here's a, here's a statement. It's already there in your manual. But let's read this together. All of us, please. Ready? Read. Now, that's a very important principle. We are not to interpret Scripture in the light of our experience, but we are to interpret our experience in the light of Scripture. Now, friends, I have nothing against stories. I have nothing against experiences. But brothers and sisters, we do not preach from our experiences. We preach from the Bible. You don't make your experience as the sermon. You know, our experiences can amplify, can help us understand what the Bible says. But we preach from the Bible and just back it up with our experience. We don't use our experience and then find a verse to back up our experience. And that's the problem. Many people they have experiences and they try to look for a verse that would back up their experience. And most of the time, they twist the Bible in order to back up their experience. And so that's, that's very important, especially for us preachers of the Word. Now, number three, the ideological level. Write down the word ideological level. Now, our ideology, of course, is our mental framework, you know, the big picture, how we understand things, you know, how it works. And uh, there was a time when we had this sister in the Lord, we found out that she hated reading in the Bible the word Father. You know, when we pray our Father, you know, she just hates the word. And we said, that's the best title for God, Father, call him your Father. I mean, when you pray, napaka impersonal, you say, oh, great CEO in heaven, great CEO in heaven. Oh, administrator of heaven and earth. Administrator of heaven and earth. Mas maganda. Our Father. Yun mas maganda. But you know what, what we found out? Her ideology, the way she understands things growing up, she was raped by her own father. And she just hated the word Father. If she can just erase that from the Bible, she would erase because it would bring back memories. That's not the kind of father that she grew up in. And so again, our ideological uh, uh, level, our mental framework, our big picture. And then number four is our methodology. The methodological level, the methods that we use in Bible study. Now friends, we need to realize that not all Bible study methods are created equal. You know, bawat method, meron niyang sariling presupposition, meron niyang sariling uh, bias. All right? Now, there are at least two. Generally, there's two. Uh, major views here. One is what we call the lower criticism where we study the Bible in its historical, grammatical, and literary context. You know, you just approach the Bible. You know, you already assume that this is God's word. You already assume that this is, that this is true. And so you just study it historically, grammatically, and literarily and get as much 
feeding that you can get from the Word of God. But then there's a methodology today, of course, we call this the higher criticism. And then in higher criticism, there are several of these uh, methodologies. Uh, let me just give you one example. This higher critical method called reduction criticism. Listen to how it works. Reduction criticism is the theory that different copyists and, all, and commentators of the early biblical writings embellished. Ano ibig sabihin ng embellished? Dinagdangan. No? Dinagdagan. And then altered. Ano ibig sabihin ng altered? Binago, dagdag bawas, no? may dagdag bawas sa salita ng Panginoon. The biblical text throughout early Jewish and Christian history to make them appear more miraculous, inspirational, and legitimate. So that means with this methodology, when you approach the Bible, when you read your Bible, there's already an assumption, something is wrong here. May dinagdag dito, may binawas dito. I need to find out ano yung dinagdag, ano yung binawas before I can learn something from this. Therefore, you question the validity of the Bible. And so friends, reduction criticism reduces the quality of the biblical record, casts strong doubt on its inspiration, and implies that the Bible is not trustworthy as a historical document. Now, we're not trying to say that all methodologies from the higher criticism are without value. Obviously, they have value. But what we're only saying here is you need to be careful. Not all methodologies are created equal. All right? You need to find out what's the bias behind this methodology. All right? So, number six, and finally, the sixth reason why there are different interpretations is we tend to indiscriminately apply passages to justify our beliefs. We tend to indiscriminately apply passages to justify our beliefs. And so, dito po, where we choose a text outside its context, and then it becomes a pretext. Again, there was this uh, caricature that I saw, this uh, Christian lady looking through her Bible, and then at the end, she said, Well, there must be scripture somewhere to back up my opinions. And you know, that's the problem. You already form your opinion, you're just looking for a verse to back up your opinion. And usually to do that, you have to manipulate a verse in order to back up your opinion. Now this is unfortunate, but this happened. There was a pastor who went to the U.S. to attend a seminar. And you know, she was a, he was able to get a visa, a tourist visa. How many months on tourist visa? Six months. Six months. And so he was in the U.S. for six months. And then, lampas na siya sa kanyang uh, legitimate stay. And then on his 10th month, he looked for a job in America. He's running low on his funds. And then he applied as a pastor in a church in America. And you know, when the pastoral search committee interviewed him, they said to him, Pastor, this is highly <laughs> illegal. You cannot apply for a job. You're a TNT here in America. And Pastor, what does the Word of God say about this? And you know what the pastor said? The pastor said, God spoke to me. Maha, nako, nakakatakot niya, basta God spoke to me. Hindi mo na kukustunin niya, Panginoon na yan eh. You know, it's already God who spoke to him. But you know what? He opened the Bible and God said to me, for our citizenship is in heaven. You see? We are not controlled by American citizenship, Filipino citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. And then, he backed up from verse 20, punta siya sa verse 13, sabi doon, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Wow! Can you see that? It's okay. Kapatid, i-memorize mo yan, baka magamit mo later on. Huwag <laughs> naman. Huwag kapatid. Out of context yan. But then, here's a more serious uh, situation. There was a Filipina nurse in New York. She's a non-Christian. Her husband is back in the Philippines. She kept sending her dollars to her husband. And then the husband quit his job and is now just waiting for the dollars to come. And so, you know, they didn't have children. So she felt so bad about this. But then she became a born-again Christian in New York. When she became a Christian, she got involved in a fellowship and she noticed the stark difference between a non-Christian guy and a Christian guy. Ang laki ng difference ng Christian sa non-Christian. And here's the problem. She fell in love with a Christian man in New York. And now she's having a struggle 
Now she's asking God, Lord, there's a new man in my life. What should I do with that old man back in the Philippines? And so ngayon, ang ginawa niya, just like a horoscope, Lord, speak to me, she closed her eyes. What should I do with that old man back in the Philippines? There's a new man in my life. And she opened the Bible, she opened her eyes, and sure enough, the verse in Ephesians 4, put off the old man, be renewed, and put on the new man. Okay na. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer. And so again, you know, we, it's so easy to twist the Bible just to justify our beliefs. Just to justify, you know, our present situation. So friends, here's the final picture in this uh, segment. You have here somebody who's studying the Bible. We have here the biblical text. Now, it's not wrong to have biases. There's nobody in this room right now without biases. Every time we read our Bible, we are biased readers. That's not the issue. All of us, when we approach the Bible, we have biases, we have questions that we want answers. But friends, here's what needs to happen. When we read the Bible with our biases, we need to allow the Bible to challenge those biases. We need to allow the Bible to even change those biases so that the more we read the Bible, the more we adjust those biases according to what the Bible says until the question we ask is the same question that particular passage is trying to answer. Friends, when there's the meeting of the question you're asking and the question the author is trying to answer in that passage, then that means you have the right interpretation. Now, this is what we call the hermeneutical spiral. Again, what we're saying here is not wrong to have a bias, but allow those biases to be challenged and to be uh, corrected by the Bible until the question we ask is the same question that particular passage is also trying to answer. Okay, so that's it. <laughs>